Part 1 You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played only once. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. You will hear a telephone conversation between a client who wants to rent short-term accommodation and a rental agent. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning. Ace Accommodation. How can I help you? Good morning. I'd like to organise some short-stay accommodation on the Gold Coast, please. Certainly. Who am I speaking to? Miss McKinley. Sylvia McKinley. Could you spell your family name for me, please? It's M-A-C-K-I-N-L-A-Y. Thank you. And your first name is Sylvia? Yes. Is that with an I or a Y? A Y, the old-fashioned way. That's S-Y-L-V-I-A. Thank you, Miss McKinley. Now, just for our records, can you tell me what country you live in? Of course. It's England, actually. I thought so. Now, when are you coming? Well, at the moment, we're planning on arriving on July the 26th. Oh, the 25th. That's the last day of the public holiday, and it might be difficult to find something available on that date. No, we're coming on the 26th of July. Oh, well, that's fine then. We'll have lots of good places vacant by then, although you wouldn't be able to move in until late afternoon because our cleaning crew will need time to get everything ready for you. That suits us. Our flight won't get in until early evening anyway. How many of you will there be? Just my sister and myself. And how long do you intend to stay? Oh, only a couple of weeks. We'd like to stay longer, but we'll have to get back to work. So, you're not coming on business, then? No, it's just a holiday. Why? What difference does that make? Oh, you'd be surprised. Business people have different needs. You know, wireless internet, even fax machines and photocopiers. No, we won't need any of that stuff. We'll be coming to relax and get away from all that kind of thing. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Good. Now, what exactly are you looking for? A house, a duplex or an apartment? What's a duplex? Oh, that's what you might call a townhouse or a unit. You know, two houses semi-detached on the same property. Oh, I see. I think an apartment will suit us just fine. And how many bedrooms? Two. One or two. It depends on the size. 
My sister and I don't mind sharing, if it's a decent-sized bedroom with two beds. Well, that makes it easier. And car parking? Will you require a lock-up garage? They're a little harder to find with an apartment. We'll have a higher car, and as far as I know, there are no regulations concerning car parking. I think as long as it's not parked on the street and it's secure, there shouldn't be any problems. OK. Now, I'm assuming you want something by the beach. Yes, that's the idea. We want to enjoy the surf, sand and sunshine. OK. But before we settle on an area and discuss your price range, I'll need to know about other necessities. What do you mean? Well, for example, do you want to be close to a shopping mall or the casino or the fun parks? Or do you want to be in a complex with or near a swimming pool? No, none of that really matters to us. But we'd like to have reasonable access to the motorway so that we can drive up to Brisbane to visit friends there. Well, there are quite a few lovely small towns to choose from. There's Main Beach, which is north of Surfer's Paradise, or Mermaid Waters, which is a bit further south, or Palm Beach, which is quite a bit further south. Mermaid Waters sounds delightful. Is it close to the motorway? Well, not really. The M1 is actually closest to Palm Beach and prices are likely to be more reasonable there, too. That's settled, then. Palm Beach it is. Now, if you'll just give me your email address, I can send you information about the town and lots of photos. Well, my email is smac13 at hotmail.com. And one final thing. How much are you looking to spend per week on accommodation? Do you want something at the luxury end of the market? You know, newly redecorated, great views, all the mod cons? Not necessarily. Could we get something clean, comfortable and reasonable for $1,200 a week? Could you stretch that to $1,500 a week? I've got a property in mind that you'll absolutely love, but you'd have to go to $1,500. 1200 wouldn't cover it. All right, then. But that's our top limit. Good. I'll get on to this straight away, and there should be something in your inbox shortly. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a member of the Active Outdoor Club talking to a group of interested potential members. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. I'd like to welcome you all to our Active Outdoor Club. I'll start by telling you a little bit about the history of the club and all that it can offer, and there will be a chance for you to ask questions over tea and coffee in the lobby afterwards. You'll also be able to pick up pamphlets from the table at the back of the hall and if you wish to purchase any of our products, Bill will serve you at the front counter. As most of you probably know, the club was founded by Nick Noble about 30 years ago. He thought of placing an advertisement in the local newspaper or erecting a billboard somewhere. But it was the radio that he decided on to reach the most people. You know, 
other people who might be interested in outdoor pursuits, just basic activities like walking or tramping, anything active that could take place in some of the beautiful outdoor settings that this country has to offer. Nick was overwhelmed by the response he got, and the club soon grew from a dozen or so friends and enthusiasts to around 200 members 20 years ago. And steadily since then, to reach a membership of over 2,500 now. You don't have to be a hardened athlete or extreme adventurer. On the contrary, it's a group that encourages friendship and fellowship through social and recreational activities. The club tries to cater for all levels of maturity and both genders. In fact, anyone who has the physical ability and a moderate level of health and fitness to participate in open-air activity on a regular basis. I think our youngest member is a five-year-old boy, and our oldest member is a 75-year-old man. Of course, we have more challenging opportunities for those who are up to it, but all excursions are graded according to level of difficulty, and there will always be something for those families with small children. More about that later. I'm sure you realise that it's part of the focus of the club to ensure that our natural environment is kept as pristine as possible. We all have a keen interest in conservation, and many of our members contribute their time or give a monetary donation to organisations that work to enhance and beautify our natural heritage. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. OK, now going back to the grades of activity, first of all, tramping. This is very popular with singles and couples without children, but is certainly not restricted to those groups. Tramping is arranged for Tuesdays and Saturdays throughout the year. Most tramps are of a duration of three to five hours, depending on the weather and the terrain, and of course the time of year. You would need to check the newsletter or the website to find out place and time, and, if you wish to participate, phone the coordinator who can give you more information. I'll move on now to walking, which is very popular with families, but open to everyone, and walks are arranged for every Thursday and every Sunday over the course of the entire year. Walks last no more than three hours, although the Thursday walks might be shorter. And again, you would have to check the newsletter for details of the time and area to meet and get in touch with the walking organiser to confirm your participation. Now, the Wanderers are what you might call a subgroup of the Active Outdoor Club. This group was set up to cater for the less active, more elderly, or families with very young children who still want to enjoy the great outdoors, but without quite so much exertion. Bear in mind that the length of these activities is variable, but we're always home before dark. Any member of the club is welcome to join in their activities on a Sunday, which include visiting some of our more beautiful parks and botanical gardens, beach walks, picnics, and even boat trips to visit some of the small islands off the coast. Often guided tours can be arranged if there is enough interest. If you'd like to see what the Wanderers are up to, check the website and then phone the leader for more information. I'll bet you're all ready for that cup of tea now. But before I finish, I really must mention something that can be a lot of fun. A great opportunity to form new or strengthen existing friendships and a chance to explore a part of the country that you may never have seen before. These are our mystery weekends. The committee puts a lot of time and effort into the organisation of these weekends away, not only for health and safety reasons, but also to ensure that everything runs smoothly 
and everyone has a good time. There will be a charge to cover travel and accommodation costs, but apart from that, it's an affordable and exciting weekend away from the city. For more information, call the chairman of the committee. You'll find his phone number in the newsletter. So, that's all I have to say at this point. Please enjoy the refreshments, chat with the others, and feel free to ask questions. All the committee members are wearing large red name badges, so they're easy to find. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between an academic advisor and a student asking for information about a particular subject that she wants to study. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Listen carefully, and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Come in and take a seat. Thank you. Now you've made an appointment to see me with regard to one of the papers you want to enrol next semester. Yes, that's right. It's the Globalization and Educational Change paper, GEC six nine two. Ah, well, I know the one you mean. But all the code numbers are going to change next semester. So although the course name will stay the same, the code will be ED nine nine five. Not that you have to worry about that. But the content will be the same, right? Oh yes, to a large extent. The objectives are still to provide you with the skills and knowledge for analysing the challenges that globalisation poses for education. Yes, that's what I'm really interested in. The future of education, not where we are now, but where we're heading. Well, you'll most likely enjoy the course because it'll give you the opportunity not just to explore, but also to document the advancement of new educational developments. And there'll be quite a lot of analysis involved. Yes, obviously. But once you've examined how education has been affected by cultural values and socio-economic structures, you'll go on to debate the pros and cons of the restructuring of public education in view of rapid globalization. I see. But when you say public education, do you mean worldwide? No, no. That would be far too large an undertaking for just one paper. You'd probably choose to work with the education system within your own state or country. Sounds interesting, but isn't it a bit restrictive? Not at all. From there, you'd move on to explore the impact of internationalisation on curriculum diversity in both developing and developed countries. Have you had a chance to look at the assessment criteria yet? Actually, I have. And it makes me a bit nervous just thinking about it. Why is that? Well, I see that the first assignment starts with an illustrated PowerPoint presentation to the rest of the class. I've never done one before. No need to worry. You can get help with that. Anyway, this presentation isn't graded. It's what we call a formative assessment. The feedback you get will help you to finalise the written review. That's a review of those academic articles in the first part of the reading list, right? Yes, but you only have to choose five of them. That first assignment is worth thirty percent. And the second assignment? There are two parts to that also, and both are graded. Twenty marks will go towards your participation in a seminar, and then there's a five-thousand-word essay. 
which will be graded out of 50. Thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Is there anything else I can help you with? Yes. The reading list is quite long. Where do you think I should start? Well, I'd suggest you leave the articles until the semester is underway, but a good preparation would be to look at some of the major texts. These ones here. In any particular order? You could start with this one by Tower, here at the bottom of the page. Sorry, who? Tower. T-O-W-E-R. 2007. Comparative Education. That should give you a good basis. Then move on to Elliot. Educational Issues of the New Millennium. But be sure to get the 2008 edition, not the original 1998 edition because so much has changed since 1998. The new edition has extensive revisions and a lot of new material. OK, so that's Tower first, then Elliot. I think I could handle a couple more over the summer break. Well, in that case, look for Brown's Education and Globalisation, published in 2009. Actually, there are quite a few books by Brown but I'd start with that one and leave his others till much later. And I'd also really recommend this one here, Globalisation and Knowledge Policy by York, published quite recently, in fact, 2010. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture on immunity and immunization. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon, and thank you for your warm welcome. This will be the first talk in a series of five on health interventions, protection and prevention. Could I start by asking for a show of hands? How many of you have had a flu vaccination at the beginning of winter? Hmm, I thought so. You young ones always think you're indestructible. Well, as you are no doubt aware, disease-spreading germs or pathogens are everywhere. On a daily basis, the human body has to ward off attacks by various harmful bacteria and viruses. A healthy body has a good defence system against many of these germs, but the defence only operates well against microorganisms that it has already encountered in which case it is said to be immune. There are two ways in which humans acquire natural immunity. Actively, when a person has first suffered and then recovered from an illness, and passively, when ready-made protection is transferred into the body, for example, from the maternal blood via the umbilical cord to an unborn child, or through breast milk. Now, artificially acquired immunity can help the body to fight disease, so we can use active immunization as a preventative measure. 
This is when a person is vaccinated against an illness by injection or oral ingestion of a tiny amount of weakened or inactive germs, not enough to actually cause him or her to contract the illness, but sufficient for the body's defence system to recognise and respond to the threat by forming antibodies. Intervention using passive immunisation, on the other hand, is a method of curing an illness after it is too late for prevention. It is less effective than active immunisation and takes longer to work. It is used when the body has already been invaded by bacteria and the person is ill. In this case, there is no time for the body to make antibodies of its own, so proteins, usually taken from the blood of animals, are injected to equip the patient with the essential antibodies to combat the particular illness. Let's have a quick look at a bit of history. The discovery of vaccination to boost the body's immune system by making it sensitive to particular disease-causing bacteria was made by an 18th-century English doctor called Edward Jenner. He noticed that survivors of smallpox, a common but extremely dangerous disease, never contracted the disease a second time. In other words, they were immune. He studied a similar disease in cows called cowpox and realized that people in contact with the infected cows became ill with symptoms resembling smallpox. However, this disease was quite mild by comparison, and those who contracted cowpox were then immune to smallpox. He conducted an experiment by injecting a child with a small amount of pus taken from a cowpox pustule. The child subsequently became ill, but soon recovered. Later, he injected the child with pus from a smallpox pustule, and the child did not get sick. He had developed immunity to the more dangerous disease. The antibodies produced to fight the cowpox bacteria had been able to fight off the smallpox bacteria. What are antibodies? Well, antibodies are made by white blood cells called B lymphocytes, and this is done in response to the presence of antigens or other bacterial toxins which have been released by the microorganisms, what we commonly refer to as germs, that have invaded the body. These Y-shaped antibodies, or you can think of them as antitoxins, may stop the toxins or repair the damage they have done by what is known as the antigen-antibody reaction, which takes place within the plasma of the blood. A correct antibody, for that disease, clings to a particular antigen in order to render it harmless. Large numbers of these pairs clump together to form a bigger unit. This is called agglutination and is able to be seen by the naked eye, which is very helpful for doctors and other specialists to determine which illnesses a patient is immune to. Inoculation or active vaccination can protect people from serious diseases. The vaccine may make a person feel unwell for a few days when the immune system starts to produce antibodies to match the introduced antigen.